So today it's been maybe five years, and the city is beautiful. I just, this is a beautiful, amazing city. I don't understand what anything anyone is saying though because of your Canadian accent. <laughs> um, this morning you were mentioning a washroom. What's a washroom? <laughs> I think I think that's a like a bathroom, right? That's what we call a bathroom, right? Um, Eli actually has been trying to teach me some slang, some uh, Canadian slang. So we were tweeting back and forth, and he said, "Boo, do you know what a keener is?" And I said, "No, what's a keener?" He said, well, you better know, because you'll be talking to a hundred of them today. <laughs> so. um, and I'm really glad to be here. Today, the role in equity and social justice, I spent a lot of time on this PowerPoint, by the way. It took like five hours to get the flames and the unicorns to run up just right. And I think this is what, this is the unicorn represents us in the nonprofit sector. So, right, so there we are. That's us. We are magnificent. And we are really attractive too. Right. So nonprofitball.com, and if you're tweeting nonprofit W balls. Okay. So some disclaimers. First of all, I am not an expert on data or nonprofits or anything uh, at all. In fact, like most of you, I am mainly here today to avoid working on a Friday. <laughs> so but I, I do like to spark conversations, and I like to, you know, to get people to think about things that maybe they're not talking about. And so today we'll, we'll be talking about data, but again, I, I'm not an expert, and I, I would encourage you to challenge me. In fact, if you have any questions, if you want to challenge anything that I'm saying with additional data or correct anything, please feel free to raise your hand in the middle of my keynote speech and ask it. I really <laughs> should. I would prefer this to be a conversation than just me talking for like an hour. And at the end, we'll have a little bit of time for, um, for, for questions and answers. And please ask. And again, please argue because this data stuff is complex and we need to talk about it. Uh, disclaimer number two. Uh, data is actually a plural, right? The singular is datum, and the plural is data. So when you say, you know, the data is, it's kind of kind of wrong. Uh, it should be the data are. But no one really cares about this anymore. If you are a keener who really cares about that stuff, you know, you should get your tweeting out of the way right now because I'm just going to use them interchangeably, right? Disclaimer number three, there will be a lot of baby animals on this slide. <laughs> because data shows, and data collected by Japanese researchers, by the way, show that if you have pictures of baby animals, if you look at them for about 10 minutes a day, it increases productivity. And their hypothesis is that pictures of cute baby animals put you in a good mood. And when you're in a good mood, you are more productive. Right? Of course, there's this curve. You can't be looking at that for like four hours a day. I think you're going to be productive. So maybe 10, 15 minutes. This is why I mandate all my staff to have at least 10 or 15 pictures of baby animals in their cubicles because I want them to be productive. Okay. So stuff we'll be talking about today. Um, data has become really big. It's, everyone is talking about data, big data, small data, medium data. And you know, it's, funders are providing more and more pressure on us to get more and more data. And uh, so, but we need to talk about cultural competency. So we talk about history, a little bit of how data was used in the past, how the challenges with data now, and then what I what my friend calls the weaponizing of data, and then what we need to do against it, because data can be either very helpful or extremely damaging to many marginalized communities, uh, especially communities of color. So, and then what, you know, what we can do about it. Okay, why data is awesome. I don't need to convince you why data is awesome. I mean, with so much going on, all the chaos that is out there, we need to start synthesizing things into ways we can understand. Plus, you, people are very subjective, and we need objective ways to look at things so we can make better decisions. So that's, you know, data is it's really cool, and it's fun to look at charts and graphs and things, right? Very good. Okay, so here's some awesome nonprofit data that helps us to do our work. One is the nonprofit economy contributes $800 billion to the economy every single year. Nonprofits, that's why we're unicorns. 
5.5% of GDP in the US and 6.8% of GDP in Canada is bought by the nonprofit sector. Okay? So we are pretty cool. It's the third largest workforce. We employ 10% of workers in the US, 12% in Canada. Okay? And over 15 billion volunteer hours generated by our sector every single year. We are so cool, and the media just don't understand it. Right? I was watching a Law & Order episode, and it was there was a there was an episode where there was a nonprofit and it was selling organs, human organs in the basement. <laughs> and this was ridiculous. This is the perception that we had in the media: is that we we have social workers who are removing kids from their families, and we have nonprofits that are doing illegal things. And that's, it's awful. I mean, no more than 5% of us nonprofits are selling organs illegally <laughs> from our basement. Right? We need the data to see this. We need to get this much better data about the nonprofit sector. We need to disseminate it and we need to disseminate the data much better because, you know, there's just so many shows about lawyers and doctors and they're all attractive people who are just like, you know, entangled in relationships and you learn about their job and it, it it glamorizes these professions. Why don't we have like a show about <laughs> nonprofits? You know, be like attractive actors filling out nine ninety four tax forms <laughs> and attending strategic planning meetings, and conferences. You know, we need more of that. Okay, okay. and increasing growth. We are growing at least in the U.S. for a rate of two point one percent, while the business world, I think, last year decreased by 0.06%. So we are growing. So data is cool because it shows how awesome we are. <laughs> However, it's, it's also very important that we show some of the, the depressing data in our, in our sector because we have to get people to understand the challenges that we're dealing with. Okay, so this data. 58,000 veterans are homeless each night in the US. Every single night, 58,000. 218 million is in child labor right now. And quite a few of them are going to die from it, from, from injuries that they receive. A million kids die from starvation every single year in the world. And 36 football fields of rainforests are lost every single minute. We need the data to shock people so they can actually do. And if we combine the data that we have like this with really interesting stories, then I think we have a really compelling reason as to why people should be supporting the work that we are doing. We have to get people to understand the work better because they are so distracted. Okay, but data is like fire. It could be used to warn people or it could be used to, to burn people and really affect entire communities. So that's why I call it the game of data, which is a lot like the game of thrones, but way less beauty. <laughs> so let's talk about data and history for a bit. Here is one example of data that just went horribly awry, just totally wrong, is phrenology, which happened a couple hundred years ago um, or so. And this was a study, okay, actually, everyone do me a favor and feel um, above the ear. Here, go ahead. Touch your ear, right above your ear. If you have, do you have a bump? Who has a bump there? Anyone? Okay, you are all thieves and pickpockets. <laughs> so this was a guy named Franz Joseph Gall who discovered this. And he, he was looking at basically humans and versus our brain structure, our head structure versus animals. And he was postulating that this is why humans are so much smarter than the animals because we have different brain structure. And then he went and he observed some pickpockets and some, and some thieves and discovered that what they had in common was a bump above their right ear, or one of their ears. So he, said, so he started, you know, kind of theorizing that, that we have all these, our brains made of different organs. And they affect our personalities. He studied, he went to prison and he studied murderers and other people who were in prison. He studied cadavers and other people. Um, and he came up with a theory that our brains made of like 27 organs. And they are big or small based on how much we use them. And so if you use like your pickpocketing you know, skills quite a lot, then the part of your brain that gets bigger will be your pickpocketing bump. And so your head will grow a bump over it and you can feel it. And then, you know, 
your poop bucket. <laughs> um, he actually has, one of the organs is uh, the murder organ. So he can tell by your head if you are likely going to be a murderer. Um, now this sounds like quackery to all of us, but this was scientifically accepted for, a long, for, a few, for quite a few years. And it spread from the UK over to the United States. And quite a few people bought into it. Ralph Waldo Emerson and Edison all bought into this. They thought this was like, this is like real data. And this is when science was getting very popular and people went to scientific lectures as part of their entertainment. So people would go around having talks about phrenology and it, it started spreading until it was kind of disproven that this is just a ridiculous pseudoscience. But again, for a long time, it was data. From this chart here, it's, it's led to a lot of things like eugenics, where you can, you can kind of say that you know, the, the shape of people's heads and their features are directly correlated to how intelligent they are. So it's been, it's been used for awful, awful things such as apartheid in South, um, South Africa. I was reading up on this, and it is really depressing. If you, if you really want to be depressed, Read about apartheid. Uh, it was just one of the most systematically racist um, systems ever. It was just absolutely terrible. They were using it to cut, they had a categorization system where you have to be categorized. And if you were categorized as black or colored or European or whatever, and if you were black, you had to carry this passport that details everything your job, who you married, your ex relationship, your doctor. It was a 90 page book that you had to carry with you at all times. And then, certain, there are certain laws. You cannot marry someone from a from different race. You can't even live in the same area. Uh, if you are not white, you cannot be in the same area for more than 72 hours without permission. And this caused all sorts of problems for people, for families. So, for except, especially for like mixed families, uh, or people who had, who had variations. If your kids don't look exactly like you do, if they were a little bit darker, they had, I was reading up on some accounts where we had, there was a family who, whose daughter, because of some genetic thing, she was a little bit darker than they were. And I think the neighbors turned her in, and they had to uh, recategorize her, or they, when they were applying to get her recategorized, or, you know, it was, it was, it was a mess. At the end, she ended up having to work as, she had to be categorized as a servant in her own family in order for her to live in her house. There was another family who was categorized as colored, um, and it, was, it ruined things for them so badly that they made this pact to commit suicide if they could not get recategorized, which could take months or years to do. It was really terrible. And also, really silly, too. Like, for example, if there are different ambulances. So if you are European, you have to be picked up by a European ambulance if you get injured. And if you are colored, the same. And you cannot get picked up, you know, vice versa. So if you are, if you're white and you're bleeding on the street, you can't, you can't get picked up. But at the very least, you know that if you die, you would get buried in an all-white cemetery. Um, also, you cannot get autopsy done on you by a colored person or, or a black person. And all this, again, was tied to eugenics, which is a lot of it was, you know, like different races and how how some are more superior than others. And all of this was scientifically written about. So the data that they were using to support all this stuff was considered science to many. Right? This image up here is called the pencil test, which I learned about, which is basically they had really detailed ways to determine to categorize you. Because people look very different, and we have different ancestries, so they have to figure out different tasks to categorize people. And they would examine your features and your hair and your earlobe, and they said, I think they said that uh, black people had softer earlobes, so they would check your earlobes and things like that. And this is the, the pencil test, which is basically, if you, for some reason, is categorized as European, but someone thought that you were actually more colored or black, then one of the tests, they might pull you over and say, well, we're going to do this pencil test on you, which is they take a pencil and they stick it in your hair and ask you to kind of tilt your head. And if the pencil does not fall out, then you cannot be categorized as European. 
All right, that's pretty impressive, right? Let's go back to baby animals. <laughs> okay, here are some ducklings. So we talked about apartheid and phrenology, and that's probably the best. So here's a duckling. All right, so data, we think of data as objective. And it could be, it might as well, it could be. But human beings are subjective. And so it's extremely difficult to get objective data in, by any means. So climate change, for example, we still have a lot, we have so much data supporting the theory that there is the change in, in climate and, and global warming. And yet we still have so many things we just refuse to buy into this, who refuse to continue to pollute. Immunization, we still have this huge, I mean, there's some people who just refuse to to immunize their kids, to give shots to their kids. They think it's linked to autism and things like that. And there's just been so much data to disprove that. That is so much more dangerous if you don't give shots to your kids. But again, it's, it's difficult when we deal with human emotions. Education. I deal a lot with an education in, uh, in Seattle. And education has gotten so contentious and so awful we have this law called no, no Child Left Behind, which is trying to get more accountability to teachers. We start testing students way more often. We start linking teachers' pay to students' um, performance. And after five years or six years of No Child Left Behind, there has been no close closing of the achievement gap. It's still the same. We still have the same types of issues. But we're forcing kids to take these are ridiculous standardized tests. My wife is a fourth grade teacher, and they had to administer a standardized test. And it was really awful because many of the tests are now on computers. Many of these low-income kids do not have access to computers at all. And the schools are so poor that they could not even have so kids computer for every single kid. So they had to take turns. And the kids who were able to get like a practice session. These are kids who have never touched a mouse before, are now forced to go on and use a computer test and click on things that they had never used before. And then that determines how well they are doing. And we have, I don't even watch John Oliver, but there was a clip that he did on just how ridiculous it is and how monetized it is. All these testing companies have been making a ton of time, tons of money testing kids. And it's gotten so bad, kids are crying. My wife took a picture of her, of her class taking these tests, and there was one kid who was just like underneath the desk, just kind of weeping underneath his desk. And there was another one who was just like, his, her head was down on, on the keyboard. Um, kids are throwing up on tests, and so much so that some of the test instruction booklets have instructions of what to do if your kids throw up <laughs> on the instruction booklets, on, on the on their answer sheet. <laughs> so this has this is when data just goes totally, totally wrong. We are also having uh, something called a data wall um, in many schools where now we put up kids' data and their test scores onto walls. They can see how well they're doing and how well they suck if they are <laughs> sucking. And oftentimes kids will feel horrible. So the kids who are not doing so well, oftentimes again it's because they are at home, they don't have a lot of help or they don't speak much English, or their parents work three jobs and they can't get their homework in on time every single day. And they feel like crap because they can't do the work. I remember because I am one of these English language learner kids who I came over when I was eight, and I didn't speak much English, I didn't speak any English at all. And I remember being in school and taking home my homework to my parents, and they didn't understand anything. So every single day I would bring back my homework and there was no one to help me. And I just felt horrible. You know, and I would get low marks on it. And that's what we're doing with kids. But now, because of the push for data, we're forcing teachers to really focus more on data. We're forcing counselors to do more data. My wife was talking about a counselor at one of her, uh, at a school that her friend teaches at. And the, the counselor has 400 kids. And his caseload was, was only supposed to be 200. So because of the poor funding education, he had 400 kids. And most of his work was collecting data on these kids, even though a lot of his, he was supposed to be there to be counseling them on bullying and eating disorder and abuse and things like that and self esteem. But instead, he ends up testing students quite a lot. And one day he just said, you know what, screw it, 
I'm just going to spend more time t talking to kids and doing my job. And uh, so he was, he was counseling kids. He was meeting with them and talking to them. And he got punished for it because he was not collecting enough data that the school required under whatever laws that, that they had. Okay, so let's talk about data in the nonprofit sector. All right, now we have a lot of pressure from funders on, on collecting data. We have outcomes and metrics. We have a logic model that we have to do. And then we have to report on all that stuff. But it is really difficult to measure the outcomes that we have. It is really difficult. The stuff that we're doing, you know, with mental health counseling, with helping the homeless and helping kids, um, it's just so hard to measure. And certain stuff cannot be measured, but that does not mean that they are not worth doing, right? If you are helping a kid in your program, you know, pre preventing high school dropout, for example, and the kid drops out anyway after three years, like one, one year shy, you can't report that your program succeeded, can you? Because he dropped out in your dropout prevention program. But the three years of intervention that you had may have amazing consequences on this kid's life. You may be later on, you might think about what you said, and then a year later he decides to go back and get his GED or something. Right? Data would have us say that no, that program does not work. But we know from working on the ground that it's way more complex than that. And we have to be able to capture that sort of data as well and demonstrate that to funders. There's no standardization of processes, 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 I think is kind of funny how you say it here. And content, co content. <laughs> so funders, are there any funders in the room? Okay. There's a couple? Alright. I'm going to try it. I think I go on my keynote streets and I start railing against funding dynamics and stuff. And then I realize I'm actually being videotaped. And I probably should refrain from saying <laughs> so much. But look, funders have their own different variations of what they want from us, right? They want data at certain times and different ways of doing things. And they have different fiscal years and they want things, you know, when they want them. And so it's, it's it's quite challenging to collect the data that they want across the 50 funders that we're Frankensteining together to support our program. It's expensive. The data is expensive. It's very expensive, and yet no one would pay for it. No one wants to pay for this. Funders don't want to pay for stuff. We have this overhead net which we are trying to kill right now, right? But data and research is one of the last things that people want to pay for. I don't know. Spending twenty thousand dollars on a researcher, Ugh, that should be going to kids in your program. Why are you feeding the kids in your program? Um, so much data in nonprofit sector is crap because we are pressured by funders who don't standardize their requests. We are trying to figure out how to measure outcomes that are extremely complex because of this push for more and more data. We try to do our best with very limited resources. So then we come with the best way that we could, doing you know best things that we can. But this is why it, the entire field is full of data that is not usable. But we tout it. We say 40% of the kids in our program are whatever graduating, increasing by 1% on their math scores or whatever. You know, but there's very little con control group. There are a few comparison groups. You know, we're not doing a, a Pearson R test or or a T square or whatever. I don't know. I took that class way long time ago. <laughs> and if I were good at it, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I think you can go money elsewhere. Uh, all right. Another thing is data is used to hoard resources in our sector. All right. Resource hoarders. Some of you in this room. Resource hoarders. But this is the thing, right? We because of the strive for data and collecting it, and the fact that we have this hunger games of nonprofit funding, right? I call it the nonprofit funding hunger games. All of us are competing with one another. So we try to edge one another out in terms of everything, marketing, communication, storytelling, and now data. 
And the organizations that have the best resources can generate more resources. So in Seattle, we have, for example, early learning um, advocates who are amazing. Early learning is really important. I have a two-year-old kid. I strongly believe in early learning. I, I strongly believe that kids should get early education, enriching education. But the early learning advocates in Seattle have gotten so strong in their data. They've been collecting, they have the key messages, they have their data on brain development, and they use this to push you know, for more and more funding. And it's good because we need to get more funding to early learning. At the same time, they don't understand that it causes a ripple effect in terms of where resources, finite resources, are being allocated. So one of my friends and executive director of this youth learning, youth development organization, was just so depressed because they, she had lost $400,000 in one year. And basically the funder said, well, we need to shift all of this to early learning because the data says that we need to support kids when they are, are younger. So data is now being used to move resources around without giving consideration to the fact that kids grow up and they need support all the way through their development. The youth development field is not nearly as organized as the early learning sector, at least from my perspective, right? The youth development sector, we deal with, with mentorship and career counseling and identity and arts and sports and everything. And we are like the awkward teenagers that we serve. You know, with the acne and the braces and figuring out who we are, etc. Early learning has managed to figure out a little bit better and they have data to show it. And they will have data that says that a single dollar invested in early learning will yield like $12 to society. Of course, I did some of my own research by Googling things. And a dollar spent on kids, on, on, on youth, so they don't become delinquent, that they stay in school, they become contributing um, taxpayers and stuff. It saves society about $10 per dollar, too. So we have to understand when we're using data, and we have to kind of just use data to hoard resources for our own organization, right? That's not equity or social justice. All right. Here's a cat in a frog costume because that was extremely dry. And <laughs> data and cultural competency. Okay, here is a little bunny because we're going to be talking about data and cultural competency. The bunny has nothing to do with cultural competency. Um, okay, so data is one of these systems that have become this big shiny object. Again, I am a keener myself. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I can't tell you. It's good? Okay, good. I'm a keener man. And I love data. At the same time, working with communities of color, we are affected by data differently than how the dominant mainstream cultures interact with culture. I mean, with, with data. And we have to recognize this because otherwise, if we're all, you know, kumbaya and rah rah about data and without understanding just how damaging it can be, we don't understand the cultural um, context of it. For example, who has access to resources for data? Many of the community-based organizations that are led by communities of color, by you know, the, the disabled community, or LGBTQ communities, or, or whatever, they tend to be smaller. They don't have the same relationships to foundations. So they don't have the same resources to collect this data. So then it becomes this cycle. Where well, if you don't have the resources to collect the data, you don't have the data to collect the resources. Who defines methodology? Right? Who says that this is what we're going to do, that these survey instruments are what's good? Look at the, the data on, on, on education and testing. Right? We test these kids, and we come up with these questions. But who determines that these questions are correct? My wife was telling me that there was a, she saw on this test, that they were asking kids about TV guides. TV guides. They had a passage from a TV guide. I don't know if you have TV guides here in Canada, but in the US we have TV guides that no one read. No one reads. And but it shows you, you know, where the TV listings are. This is not what kids use. They don't watch TV anymore, they just go onto their computer and, and iPhone and just watch everything there. There was also a passage on the flaxseed. And the flaxseed was talking to a sunflower 
or something, and you're supposed to, and the kid, fourth grader, is supposed to extrapolate the meaning of the flaxseed and then explain it. My wife teaches at a school that is 95% kids of color. They've never heard of a flaxseed before. <laughs> right? It's, this is very popular in Seattle now, flax and marijuana. <laughs> right? If they ask about marijuana, the kids might have understood it. Uh, but flax, no one understands flax. Who interprets the finding? The findings, right? Usually we don't have enough researchers of color, just like we don't have enough people of color in the nonprofit sector. So the people who are doing the findings and the research and stuff are interpreting based on their lens. And I don't think anyone is malintentioned. You know, I don't think anyone has bad intentions about data or methodologies. But again, we have a mindset that we grow up with, and so we use those lens to interpret the data that we have. And oftentimes that leaves out many communities. Who determines the standards? We have a lot of a lot of data that compares kids of color towards white kids, for example. Right? And, and then we'll say, yeah, well, these kids of color are five grades behind the white kids. But who is to determine that that is the standard that needs to be addressed? Why don't we say, you know, if we change the standards and, and compare kids to other groups, why don't we compare them? to, I don't know, Latino kids. How do we compare Asian kids to Latino kids? Why are we comparing them all to like one group? So we have to kind of understand those things as well. All right. Now, when cultural competency is done you know, wrong, it can cause a lot, lots of issues. Um, in some ways, look, look at data on fundraising. We have, in the US, when we talk about fundraising, we say, well, like 90% of funding comes from individual donors, right? That's why you have to develop a robust individual donor cultivation strategy. And I keep hearing this over and over and over again. But I work with communities of color. And here's how it works. That's not the case in many communities of color. Because oftentimes, many organizations and many cultures, they contribute to, to churches and temples, or they send money directly home to families. Like the Vietnamese culture, until recently, there, there were no nonprofits. Because it was a communist, it is a communist sort of governmental, uh, societal structure. And the churches and temples take care of that. The government's supposed to take care of some other stuff. And so you don't have nonprofits. Only when nonprofit, non governmental organizations, NGOs come over, do we actually start understanding. But no one understands what a board is, no one understands you know, strategic planning or, or whatever. Or individual donors. I, I was leading an organization called the Vietnamese Friendship Association. And donors kept, I mean, funders kept harping on the fact that our board members are not giving 100%. And I was going around begging them, please just give five dollars so I can claim that we have a 100% board giving level. Please, here's five dollars. Please just say that you gave it. <laughs> just so we can claim it. But they're like, no. They, some of them were very adamant, they would not give five dollars. Because they don't understand why they're contributing so much time, you know, being at this board meeting every single month and doing other stuff and why they have to additional give give money when they're already donating to their church and family. The strange thing is, every time we went out to lunch or dinner, the elders would always buy. They would always buy. Because that's what we do. The elders will always pay for your for your meal. And now that I've become an elder, I try to avoid. You know, I'm all tired. Just don't go out with your people anymore. <laughs> so they're spending like fifty, hundred dollars buying our dinner, but refuse to give five dollars to the organization. Right? If we don't understand that, then we look at an organization and say, "Well, the data says that only forty percent of their board members contribute, so we're not going to fund them." Right? So that is. That's terrible. We have to be on the lookout uh, for that. Individual donors, we need, we have, they're starting to grow among the communities of color. But a lot of, a lot, oftentimes, fundraising, at least in Seattle, is basically like 95% white. There are very few development directors, development staff of color in the sector. And this is, and then people wondering, like, what is going on? Why can we not reach the communities of color? Because when we take the data, 
And the systems that we know in this sort of mainstream fundraising model, this mainstream donor-centric fundraising model, and we try to apply it to people who do not necessarily, you know, grew up in that system. And we wonder why the results are not what we want them to be. So we have to change the way that we're thinking about data and how we apply it. Again, the gap gazing, going back to education, because I'm, I'm very passionate about this, but the standardized testing. So gap gazing is uh, something that a researcher just, um, I just learned about, which is that we keep focusing on this like gap between kids of color and white kids, and there's been tons and tons of research showing that the gaps are whitening, the gap is whitening, or the gap is narrowing, and this one researcher says, that's just useless data. Why do we keep saying that? that? The problem is, you know, again, the testing methods that we use are flawed. It's imperfect data at best. So we're using a flawed system to get data that is flawed, that, that we now use to create policies that are flawed. And it also provides just a single glimpse in time of the problem. It does not talk about the history, the systems, you know, different variables that are out there affecting the data and affecting the, the results that we have. And it also makes it extremely technical solutions to something that should be adapted. We have to think about systems that would think about the gap and, and things like that. Um, okay, let's talk about weaponized data for a second. This is one of my favorite baby animals ever. It's a little baby hedgehog, and it has a leaf on its head. <laughs> and it is totally awesome whenever I feel very depressed. Um, I get a grand rejection letter or something, or my staff yell at me. Uh, I look at this picture of this baby porcupine. Just look into his eyes! <laughs> you know, baby head top tongue just sticking out. It's adorable, right? But weaponized data is bad. <laughs> this is when data is used. Weaponize intentionally or unintentionally to, to really keep the status quo or to affect communities of color in such a way where they cannot get access to resources and tools that they need to succeed. Okay. So one of the things I talk about is called trickle-down community engagement. This is when we have these large organizations that are mainstream organizations they cannot reach communities of color, but they have all the data that they need and the track records and the relationships to get all the funding. And then they would trickle down some of that money to organizations that are led by marginalized communities. But by that time, they have absorbed about 90% of the funding. And this happened repeatedly in Seattle. My organization was one of the, one of the, one of the people who was affected, who were affected by this. And we, we had an organization that was very well known, multi million dollars in budget. They got a huge grant. They could not reach communities of color, so they went to my organization and said, Hey, Vietnamese Friendship Association, we hear that you're pretty awesome at outreaching. So, can you partner with us? And so we said, Yeah, sure, we love helping kids go. So, we planned a workshop that served 100 kids, all, all different ethnicities once a month for three hours on a Friday every month. <coughs> and because we were tiny, our budget was like, I don't know, fifty thousand dollars that year. They gave us, you know how much we got from that for the entire year? Twenty five hundred dollars. <laughs> and we had to keep recount of every single pencil we bought and receipts for everything in order to do the invoicing for it. Okay. And this happened because one, we had a single community engagement. I don't know about you, but uh, here in Canada, but in Seattle, people love community engagement. All right, if you are walking down a dark alley in Seattle and you feel like someone is following you, it's probably someone trying to engage you. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, hey, buddy, go Hawks. <laughs> you want to attend a meeting? We have a summit to talk about equity. I need your voice, buddy. <laughs> and this is what it's like. The, we attend these summits, we put these stickers on these easel papers, and we vote on our top priorities, etc. And then it's all ignored. But they spend like, you know, $100,000. Or 
organizing the summit, which was double my organization's entire budget. Simply because they had, well, we have data that says this, and in order to disseminate our data, we need to have this, 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 this summit. I hate summits. <laughs> summits suck. Right? Please stop doing summits. They're terrible. And, you know, they, they look good. Because you try to get lots of people who are diverse, and then you take a picture of them, and then that is the data you need to find next year's summit to get money from next year's summit. And then many of the communities of color just get so jaded afterwards. They just leave and they're like, what the hell has happened? Where, where is the engagement when the summit is over? You know, it becomes very kumbaya sort of thing, and it's extremely damaging. You know, and that's another reason why, you know, data can be used. Because, again, people use data to put on these things. So we, we have to put a, a stop to put out communication. It is so prevalent in the field. And it's perpetuated by the fact that some organizations, some communities have access to data and some do not. Data, data disaggregation. Look at all these dogs. All right? They all look the same. Adorable. <laughs> but they are all these from a different breed. No, just kidding. I made that up. I don't know what they are. This is the Google image. But oftentimes, the point is that we oftentimes lump communities together. In Seattle, we have, in, in the area where I live, there's about know, 60 different languages, 60 different languages spoken. And it is so cool because there are so many restaurants there. It's totally awesome. We have a, a Thai restaurant next to an Ethiopian restaurant, next to a Vietnamese restaurant. And it was so cool. And I, you know, I go there to eat by myself, so I don't have to pay for anyone. <laughs> Um, but we tend to lump organizations, people together, races together. We have like the Asian race, and we have the African American race. And there's so much. We live in Vietnam, right? I mean, we're not just talking about Vietnamese versus Japanese versus Chinese, and etc. There's so many different Asian groups. But even in Vietnam, there's like 55 different ethnicities in Vietnam. You know, I belong to one of them, but there are people who have completely different cultures, who live in the mountains, and they have their own cultures and language and customs and everything. So, but the data that we have is to lump everyone together in order to make it easier for everyone to understand. In Seattle Public Schools, for example, after much fighting, we were able to get the Asian groups disaggregated into the different languages. We are still fighting to get the African immigrant kids to be disaggregated from the black American kids. Because they are not the same. They have different strengths and needs, but they are all lumped together. And finally, my organization, Southeast Education Coalition, you know, we went and we talked to the school district and we kept pushing them to disaggregate the African American and, and East African immigrant data. And we finally put on this, um, this summit <laughs> to disseminate the data that we found. And it was, we found out that once you are, once these kids are disaggregated, it, we found that the African immigrant kids were doing better than the black kids who had been there and who are native English speakers. And this was very surprising to many different people, and it just shocked people about why this would be. Why are these kids who have been here, who were born here, their families speak all news, why are they doing worse in schools versus the kids that have just arrived here within two or three years um, from Eritrea or Ethiopia and who speak a little more Tigrinya and hard. Data as a gatekeeper. That's a baby ocelot, by the way. Don't look into its eyes. <laughs> It'll steal your soul. <laughs> So, there's a gatekeeper. We have, I think we have this thing where the organizations that can get funding, they have the trust and they have the relationship with people. And then the organizations that are led by marginalized communities do not yet have those relationships. And so what happens is that data is used as a gatekeeping tool. When these organizations come up and say, hey, we have this great idea on how to address these inequities, that we spawn oftentimes is, Where's your data that proves this? 
I was on the Families and Education Levy uh, in Seattle, which is $234 million collected by, from homeowners to go into closing the achievement gap and help low-income kids um, of color and ELL kids who don't speak much English. And I was on the, the group that was determined what to do. It's $234 million. First of all, early learning advocates said, we need to put all $232 million into early learning. <laughs> and I stood up and I said, uh, no, <laughs> let's calm down a bit on that. Many immigrant and refugee kids arrive when they are 5 or 8 or 12. They're not going to benefit from early learning, no matter what your data says, okay? Your data does not account for the fact that many kids don't benefit from early learning because they're not there. It's an amazing program, but if they're not there, they're not going to benefit. We're just Anyway, but then, so we were proposing things such as more parental engagement to close the achievement gap. We have to engage parents, we have to engage families, we have to do arts, we have to do more sports because many times when kids don't speak any English, it's the arts and the sports that keep them in school. And, we, you know, we brought this up. We said, look, we have to partner with the community-based organizations and the schools to get them to work together. We need to give more funding to the community-based organizations because the school, they do some good stuff, but they, it's hard to work with them. And many families feel very intimidated coming to the schools. So, you know, let's give more money to the, to the community-based organization. And the response right away was, well, where's your data? That shows that that works. Where is it? And we have had this gap in Seattle, in Seattle Public Schools, for 30 years that it's not closing, it's actually widening. Um, and the status quo is just, well, this is what we're going to do because the data says this, even though it hasn't been working forever. And then when groups that are actually affected, the groups that are represented by the gap, you know, communities of color red groups, because we're talking about kids of color not doing as well, for example, propose different things, the response is, we can, you don't have the data, you need to prove it. And then they require not just one year of data, but two years of data in order to get funding for this study. So some organizations that are just doing amazing work, they, they got one year of data, they now have to wait an additional year trying to survive because no one would fund them because they don't have the data to survive. So it becomes this horrible catch-22. Okay. What we need to do, here it is, a little hamster, and he's eating, I think, a little tomato. <laughs> right? Isn't that great? By the way, data shows that people pay much more attention when you use baby animals in your PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> okay. So, we have to look at the context surrounding the data. Who is doing the data? Did it include the right people? Did the right people, when they sitting at the table, we have so many we have so many tables where the people who are being talked about are just not there. You know, and there's, there's now kind of a, a rallying cry which is don't talk about us without us. And, but this, this needs to apply to data as well. Because so much of the data is it's about communities that just do not have any control of the data that's being created. We have to combine qualitative with quantitative data. In Seattle, we have many organizations that are led by communities of color. And they oftentimes they're volunteer run because they cannot get the track record to get funding. And one organization does amazing work. They, they bought a building, they rallied their community to bought a building, but they are so volunteer driven that funders just refused to fund them. They said, well, you don't have a full-time executive director, we're not gonna fund you. And the funders never take time to just go down to the community center and just see how vibrant it is. Every single day, there's hundreds of people here being served. They have karaoke. They were doing Zumba last time. I was there. They were awesome. Just because they were all volunteers on paper, the data said, well, you know, only 40% of their board members contribute. They don't have a full-time executive director. They don't have a track record. They don't have cookbooks. But if you go down there and you talk to the people who are being served by them, you will realize just how amazing this organization is. And that data is never captured anywhere. So if we are going to be using data for equity and social justice, we have to understand not just the quantitative, but we have to qualitative. We have to be where people are as well. 
Let's combine data with community engagements. Uh, there is so much, so many efforts suck because they don't understand this. Just because you have good data does not mean that the communities will buy into it, especially since you're talking about them without them. And so, for example, in, in Seattle, we have this charter school movement. It has become extremely contentious, and I've seen fist fights between friends at the farmer's market. One is against charter schools, one is opposed to charter schools, one just wants to buy some heirloom tomatoes and actually got caught up in it. <laughs> and, but this, this is what it's, it's become. But we have organizations that have been pushing charter schools, and they said what well, the data says, the charter schools is what, what we need to fix the education system. We need charter schools right now, and we booked five buses. And communities are telling you, you just need to get on these buses, and we're going to take you down to Olympia to talk to these centers about it. And the communities were like, who the hell are you people? Where did you come from? You know, they were not against charter schools or for it. They didn't understand it. And they didn't have enough of the community engagement. They just went way too fast and they bypassed the people they were trying to serve. So slow down. You need to slow down. And engage the community. All right, let's take a re-examine comparison groups. Who, why, who are we comparing to? Again, you know, we tend to compare it to this, the mainstream kids, we tend to compare it to white kids. But why exactly? You know, should we maybe it might be one else to compare kids to one another? Or compare kids of different circumstances within the same race or ethnicity. We have to think about different comparison groups as well. And we have to disaggregate the data. Alright? It's no longer good enough with our diversification that we cannot just lump all kids into different races anymore. I mean, the same sort of races. We have to think about language groups, we have to combine that with different income level and things. The data that we have is flawed and oftentimes it's used to drive policies that just do not work at all. One example is um, Southeast Asian kids. You know, they had an Asian recruiter, but then they, they said, you know what, we don't need an Asian recruiter anymore. We don't need any more Asian kids to come to college because we have enough Asian kids here. So they fired their Asian recruiter. <laughs> And then we pushed this aggregated data, and found that they did not have Cambodian kids, Filipino kids, Samoan kids in, in represented in college. So then, you know, the kids and some 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 of the, the younger leaders started rallying and pushed using this aggregated data to get this position rehired so that they could focus specifically on Southeast Asian kids because they were not being served as well. Right? So we have to understand that. This aggregated data. Re examine agency and causes. So, who is, who's causing, what, what is causing these issues, right? Oftentimes, we look at the gap and we, you guys give me a five minute warning, but I think I have like one more slide left, right? Um, we, look at the, we look at the gap, we, we start blaming kids. We start blaming, we look, there was a study I, I saw, it was about, Two-year-old Latino kids, and they were falling behind. Two-year-olds falling behind white kids in math <laughs> or something. And okay, so so then we, we start blaming people, their parents, etc. We need to reexamine that. Why are we blaming? You know, where are the strengths? Where are the things that we're not looking at? And we need to think about those things. All right. So with data, it's very easy to fall into this sort of technical thing. Whatever well, it is, this, this, and this, and this. I, we can no longer afford to do that. We have to think about the adaptive changes, the entire system, the history, the context. You know, we have so many communities that have been affected by all sorts of traumas and, and things like that. And now we're just trying to put this one singular lens on them, with a single point in time using the data that we have. That data is not good enough. And the last slide, accountability versus integrity, and here's a little spot on baby duck. Right? We have been pushed towards this thing called accountability, which I actually really hate. And I think since that's captured on camera, that might just end in my political career. Because <laughs> um, accountability is really about blaming people, holding someone accountable, right? And it is used to hold people accountable. And I'm trying to get people to think about integrity and responsibility. 
when we have those things, people will always do the right things no matter if anyone is looking or if no one is. Right? We have to be able to think about the integrity and just doing the right things always without anyone holding them accountable. And if we do this, I think teachers will be allowed to teach better. Right? Kids won't have to take all these horrible tests that cause them to cry and throw up and things like that. Right? We can still use data, but we need to use it the right way to advance social justice and equity and not prevent it. Alright, I think that's it. Thank you. I bet we have time for about, say, three questions if you're efficient. Are you up for this? Yeah. yeah. Bring it on. All right. Question number one. Come at it. Who's brave? Who wants to start this off? Uh, data from donors. When a donor is giving money and they want to quantify how they're getting, what they're getting back from that money, yes. is that the start of the data devil? The, the corporate donor needed to quantify to their board of directors or their officers, this is what we got for this. Is that the genesis of it? I think it is terrible. Now, first of all, the donor centric model, this is the entire keynote speech later, I'm going to start that. <laughs> um, the donor centric model is, you know, this thing where we have the donor in the center, we need to make them feel good about everything. We should, and I believe a lot of it, I believe we should thank donors right away, we, we should appreciate every single gift, we should be transparent with our donors, we should be in constant communication with them. At the same time, I think it's gone way over for the donor-centric thing, where people are just worshipping donors and then hoarding the donors. And one of the things that we do to try to make donors feel good about themselves is say, well, thanks to you, we saved five kids from starvation or whatever. But it's way more complex than that. You know, things are interrelated. We have to get, so I'm pushing people to focus on a community-centric model, which is we have to understand that it is the entire community that needs to be in the center. The donor-centric model is what's causing people to start thinking like, well, only early learning is the best thing, right? But kids, they can't grow up. The early learning they should be talking to the youth development people. They should be introducing the donors to youth development organizations. You know, we should be learning about other areas that we may all should not be specializing in. Because right now with donor centric, we tend to have this, this image of a donor as like people on the, on, the, on the lake throwing bread at the ducks. And then we tell them, thanks to you, we save 12 ducks. And we need to stop that. All of us are ducks. All of us are ducks. We're in the same pond together. And what happens to one duck affects all of us. And we have to get funders to understand that. You know, versus, oh, thanks to you, you're on the pond, you saved the duck. You're a duck, right? And it's a good thing that you don't have to all ducks. <laughs> yeah. We probably have time for one more. Anyone else got a question for us? Take it. And if you could repeat the question. Yes. Well, so I have kind of like a, a hypothesis and, oh. and a question. And you know, you've covered a lot of territory. You've talked about data. You've talked about um, the state of the, you know, the entire not-for-profit space, the power dynamics in the space, etc. And the way that information is used in many ways to create a climate of competition, right, in the space, right, and, and um, raise up some of the larger entities and then see some of the smaller entities behind everything, right? So, to kind of reference that. My question is, and I'm really interested in, in collective, like, systems-based approaches, is there a um, strategy, or would it make sense in the not-for-profit space, maybe subsectors of education, you know, whatever, um, to kind of band together to work like systemically to both design the data sets that are necessary to standardize data, as well as to you know approach funders kind of collectively and to scale up movements that way, right? right. So um, yeah, lots more to be said about that. But. Yeah. So you're talking about using this sort of collective impact model around data and and, and systems. And then using that, you know, to be more organized and using being collective and then using that to approach funders to get resources and that way. Yeah, and also like you talk about like differences of data, right? Like this everybody has a different information set. And so basically information is just used to advance you on a get it and you decide the data set just to like pick your own needs and that's kind of what happened. So like in order to speak the same language and to get beyond that and to allow organizations um, to kind of work together, um, standardization of the types of data that you collect across the entire space would be all things 
I think it would be, I think it would be very useful. But again, we, we need to have that equity lens because sometimes collective impact has been used because they collect data that has been leaving out many, many communities that they're trying to serve. And as they get more and more powerful, it leaves out more and more people because it becomes this juggernaut. I, and Taraki notice on collective impact. I think it, it can be very good. At the same time, it needs to be done right. It needs to have the right people at the table. And if it does not look like, like the community speaks, or, then that collective impact can actually causes more harm than good. I'll be around for a bit, so please. Come Excellent. Back. Yeah, don't worry. People are going to bend your ear during lunch. So, like, again, thank you so much, Boo. That's super amazing. Really appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up. It's Boo. Woo!